Okay, great. Looks like we can start. So, hello everyone. Yeah, I'm 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 sort of joining from Hong Kong this morning, and I've lived there for almost 20 years, as Emily said. Um, I'm the one of the co-authors of a new primary series for young learners called Look, and I wrote book two, which is aimed at lower primary um, students. So we're talking you know, seven-year-olds or thereabouts. It depends sometimes on the market. Um, so it's it's great to see so many people from so many countries this, this morning for me. Um, so let's begin. Okay, let me start by asking you a question. Please answer yes or no. Here's the question. Is reading a natural skill in humans? What do you think? So you can take the, yeah, here we go. We've got the, the poll has been um, posted up here now. So answer yes or no. What do you think? Is it a natural skill in humans? Oh, it's quite, a, quite an, mm, it's not, it's quite close. Yep, there's some uncertainty. I can see some people in the text in the chat box saying, mm, "Not sure, not sure." Okay, well, let's let's stop there for now. We've got, let's see, we've got a 37% say yes, it's natural, and 64, 36-64 kind of split. 64 say no, it's not natural. Well, let me put you out of your misery now and tell you. So. No, it doesn't. Reading does not come naturally to humans. We're not born with this. Um, this is not an innate ability in humans. We're not born with it. We all have to learn how to read. Just like maybe we learn how to ride a bicycle or use chopsticks, things like that. Now, what I find fascinating about this is that once we acquire this skill, it's impossible not to do it. Let's try it out. For example, try not to read this message. Right? For us readers, it's impossible. <laughs> so this leads me to my next question for you this, today. Can you please tell me by writing into the chat box, how old were you when you first started learning to read in your native language? And I mean formally. I don't necessarily mean at home, picking up a book kind of thing. Oh, okay, so we've got lots of, uh, yeah, as I, you know, suspected, we've got quite a range here. Some people are saying three, four, um, five, six, seven, we have a range. And that doesn't surprise me. Because there's several reasons for that. Let's have a look at some of the reasons why there's such a range of ages. So a major reason is cultural norms. Um, you know, in some countries, like in North Europe, uh, children, you know, reading isn't introduced uh, into the school curriculum until the children are seven when they feel that everybody is ready and can pick it up quickly. Now, in other countries and regions, um, such as in Asia, where I'm based, uh, children generally begin to learn to read at kindergarten, so from the age of three. So we have really quite a range, and that's to do with the cultural norms of, of countries. But there are also, of course, socioeconomic factors. Um, some children grow up surrounded by books, are encouraged to read, they're in a print-rich environment. And, well, other children aren't as lucky. Um, and there's, of course, aptitude, like any skill. Some people are good at that skill and some people are not. So we can take, um, you know, uh, my friend's child, who she, uh, his, he learned to read. He taught himself to read when he was two years old. So he obviously had a very strong aptitude for reading, whereas my own child, who is now eight, is still an emerging reader. So that shows the, the level of, of um, 
you know, aptitude in this skill. So, you know, it can be, I, I asked you those two questions today because it's a kind of an introduction to our discussion about reading and developing reading in young learners of English. And it can be hard for us to put ourselves in the shoes of beginner readers. But I do want us to keep in mind today that reading is an acquired skill and also that some children acquire it for various reasons faster than others. Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit. So what does this mean for us as educators? Well, we need several uh, tools in the teaching toolkit to deal with this mix of abilities and learning styles and also interests to ensure that um, you know all our students can experience success in both learning to read in English and reading to learn in English which are two very different things as we will see. So let's start with learning to read or, or literacy and this is kind of what I refer to as the mechanics of reading. And of course, one of the most common tools in our literacy uh, toolkit is phonics. Now, over 25 years researching and writing phonics activities, which is long enough to see trends come and go, uh, I've noticed there's one thing that teachers get really fired up about, and it's phonics. Some teachers hate it. Other teachers love it. And of the teachers who use it, many have strong opinions about which approach should be used, which phonics approach should be used. Um, so, you know, um, they, they like to think that this way is the most ephonic, effective phonics approach. And two, two approaches that you may have heard of are analytic phonics and synthetic phonics. And there's a huge debate raging around those two and which one is more effective. So to use a common English expression, talking about phonics with EFL teachers is like opening a can of worms. And here's my image of, of I've got a nice image here for you of a can of worms. So let's open that can as I ask you another question. Is phonics an effective way to teach children how to read? What do you think? Let's, let's pull up another poll here. I'm just going to ask you to answer yes or no. I know it's more complex than that, but let's see what people think. What do you think? Is phonics an effective way to teach children how to read? Mm. We obviously have some lovers of phonics in the room <laughs> today. I gave this talk, uh, well, 12 hours ago, so it was last night for me, and it was more like um, kind of 80-20 split on this for yes-no. Here we've got much stronger... Um, uh, in favour of phonics. We've got 88%. So we've got 88% of people saying yes, it is uh, effective, and 11 saying no, not so. Not so. Okay, well, it's true that for some languages, such as um, Spanish, there's a one to one correspondence between letters and sounds. So if you see a letter, you know how it's pronounced. Not so in English. Um, English learners of English are faced with quite, you know, quite a challenge. I always feel quite sorry for learners of English on this point. Um, let's let me show you an example of what I mean. So we, I've pulled up here. I've got the grapheme O U G H here. I'm going to just use my pointer. So here we have this grapheme, this collection of letters O U G H. Now I'm going to pull up some words, put up some words there on the, on the slide. Go ahead and read these words one by one to yourself as they appear. Okay, here's the first word. Second word. Third word. And fourth word. 
Okay, so we have one grapheme, but we have four different phonemes for this grapheme. Let's just go through them very quickly. So the first one, O, though, second, U, through, third, Uff, rough, fourth, or, thought. Did you get them right? I'm sure you did. Now, let me give you some good news after that bad news. Thankfully, most, you know, the majority of words in, uh, in English can be decoded using the alphabetic code. So since it's unlikely that our students um, you know, are going to work out all those rules of the alphabetic code for themselves, like my friend's gifted two-year-old who managed to do that, um, it makes sense to give them those tools and to, to teach them the code so they have all those, those skills at their fingertips. And the research backs this up. It shows that phonics is an effective way to teach reading, but to be effective, it should be both systematic and explicit. So what do I mean by, by those two terms? Okay, let's start with systematic. So by systematic, I mean that it follows a syllabus that introduces the 40 plus sounds and their common spellings in a specific sequence. You know, instead of just teaching them in a an ad hoc or a casual way, which you could do. For example, you could be teaching the word chicken as a vocab word to your children. And you think, ah, oh, this is a good moment to teach. It's a good teaching moment to teach the, the digraph CH and that it's pronounced CH. So that would be a more sort of ad hoc way of teaching phonics. But a systematic syllabus, well, in fact, here I have an example for you. This is taken from, from my level of, of look. So it's book two. And if I just pull up half of the um, a zoomed in version from the scope and sequence, you can see some of the phonics syllabus there. We've got some common digraphs in my level. We've got um, some consonant blends. And later on in my level, we look at the sort of magic E, as it's called, long vowel sound. So that's in level two. So we're introducing uh, the letter sound correspondence in terms of their frequency in this course. OK. Now, I also said that a phonics approach should be explicit. What do I mean by that? OK, so by that I mean that the phonics lesson is a standalone section, a sort of discrete section of your um, course, so that um, and, you know, we can see there's a clearly mapped out um, teaching process for that phonics lesson. So this, again, is taken from my level. It's actually from um, unit one, so it's the beginning. And we can see here, if I use my pointer, that it's clearly signposted in the, in the unit. It's the phonics lesson. Here we go. And we can see the letter sound um, correspondence that we're focusing here on here is... Um, the digraph th, the unvoiced th sound, which I know in some languages is, is quite a challenge in itself. So we're introducing where we can. We introduce that, um, that letter sound in different positions in the word. So we have it in an initial position here, Thursday. And then we have it in a final position, bath. And then also in a medial position, birthday. So introducing it. Then we um, give uh, students a chant which has lots of examples of this letter sound correspondence in words that they know, familiar words. And then they do some phonemic awareness. They listen for the sound. They listen for the phoneme in some words and they decide if they can hear it or not and they tick the box. And then we bring it all together in activity four where uh, we actually have some minimal pairs here. And um, so students start by reading, reading those words, and then they listen to them and they decide which one they hear. So uh, we have, you know, 
tree and three. Bat and bath. Mat and math and so on. And they decide which ones they, they can hear. Now, there are many variables in a classroom of young learners, but one thing that's for sure is that you will have a mix of abilities in your class. It's, it's a reality, isn't it, for, for us educators. Now, some students in your class will know this phonics rule already, but that's okay. Um, they'll enjoy the feeling of mastery, and you can also um, challenge them possibly with a more complex or you know a challenging task when there are ideas in the teacher's manual. Um, so, but other students in your in your class will be learning about this particular phonics rule for the first time. So, the great thing about systematic and explicit phonics instruction is that. Um, it ensures that nobody gets left behind. I like to think of, you know, the phonics strand as a sort of literacy safety net for our young learners, or to use this image here, um, sort of helping hands that help everybody to cross over to success in reading. Yeah, and the images I'm showing you today, some people are asking, which, which book is this? Where's it from? So I'm primarily working from book two of Look because that's the, the book that I wrote. But I'm also showing some images and some pages from other, other levels of the series. So these beautiful um, photographs that you're looking at are from, are from Look. OK, so we've talked a bit about phonics. Let's look at some other um, strategies. Now, I just want to see if you've ever felt the same as, as me. Um, have you ever wondered how a child uh, can read a word that's more complex than the alphabetic code or the phonics rules that they've already learned? If you have, then you're the same as me. Let's take an example here. So I've got the word here elephant. Now, let's let's just, you know, let's just imagine that we have a group of students here and we know that they don't yet know the digraph uh, PH and that it's pronounced yet they still seem able to read this word which is, you know, quite a complex word, elephant. So there must be other strategies at play other than, you know, than decoding the word using their alphabetic knowledge. So let's take a look at what else they may be using. So another strategy is prediction. So that means children using educated guesswork. Not guesswork, but educated guesswork. So let's have a look at this. I'm going to get my pointer again here. Right, so... We have the print here, there's the word, but we also have a picture of an elephant to reinforce the print. And in our imaginary group of students, we know that we've already taught them this initial uh, letter sound correspondence, E is pronounced E. Eh. So using all this information, our students can accurately predict that this word says elephant. Okay. Let's go into this in a little bit more detail. So using pictures and words is how most educators teach vocab, right? We teach vocabulary in this way. I'm sure all of you use beautiful flashcards with your young learners with a nice picture of something and the word underneath. And just about every children's course book I've ever seen presents the vocabulary like this. And this is from my level in look, this is level two. And you can see here I've, I'm te we're teaching um, wild animals. And we have these fabulous photographs of the animals against the vocab. OK, so this is you know, what we're using here. We're using prediction skills. 
But of course, prediction alone is not going to um, get learners very far in the long term because pretty soon there won't be any pictures. So we need to have more strategies in, you know, in our in our toolbox. So let's also look at another strategy, memorization. Now, we can help learners to memorize words. And so reading words from memory by sight is the bonding of words to their pronunciations in our long-term memory. And we call these generally, we call them sight words. And to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, some common sight words are those high-frequency uh, grammar words like the, of, and to. Um, we teach these as sight words. We never teach them as phonics words, and we don't use uh, prediction. Okay, let's look a bit. Let's talk a bit more about uh, me um, memorization of sight words. So, going back to our word elephant, let me ask you another question. How many phonemes are that's individual sounds are there in the word? elephant. Go ahead and, and write in the chat box if you think you know. We've got some answers coming in. How many individual sounds? Okay, we have, we have a range of, of ideas here. Some say seven, some say five, some are saying four, three. Okay, let's take a look. Are you ready? Seven is the correct answer. We have seven phonemes. Let me just sound those out. So we have e, l, e, f, a, n, t, elephant. Now, the reason that this task may be quite difficult for you is because you're fluent readers. And as fluent readers, we don't have to go through this process of decoding every phoneme. We glance at that word and it's already been bonded to pronunciation in our long-term memory. We instantly know that that word says elephant. So as our, you know, it's become a sight word. So as our students become you know, more they develop their reading skills, these connections become consolidated in increasingly large, larger units. So we start with the letter sound correspondence, and then maybe they progress to learning some onset and rhyme, which is when you have, um, for example, k at, b at, h at, m at, that's an onset and rhyme. And then syllables, eventually they're learning whole words. And finally, they're learning, they can sight read whole chunks of language and they're, they're chunking as it's, as it's known. So at that point, our students are reading fluently. So hooray, job done. We can just, you know, sit back, have a nice cup of coffee, put our feet up, maybe read the paper. They can read. Hang on a minute, not so fast. What about meaning? And this brings me to the second part of my talk today. So as young learners are developing their literacy skills, they're learning to read in English. They're also reading to learn English. So when we present young learners with sentences and reading texts, we need to be sure that they can not only read the words, but that they can understand what they're reading. Seems, you know, obvious, really. So how can we do this? Well, of course, we need to give lots of learner support. And, you know, we need to introduce this in a scaffolded way. And if I may, I'd like to show you an example of, of what I mean by um, a scaffolded reading lesson. And I've selected um, a reading lesson from, from book two of Look here. Um, here we have it up on the, on the screen. So let's just go through the stages of this reading 
lesson. So we are going to start with vocabulary. Uh, whatever, whatever reading text you're teaching your students, and it, it can be anything, um, it's a good idea to pre-teach the vocabulary so that it's not a barrier to, to meaning. And textbooks usually do this. They kind of predict what they think you would need to uh, teach your students. And here we've got four words we're pre-teaching, cool, old, new, and borrow. But you know your students and you know your class, so you may want to read through that reading text and pull out some other words, some other content words that you think they need. So in my imaginary class, I'm also going to teach my kids collector and collection. Now, I'm not going to go into um, teaching methods to teach vocabulary because that would be a whole different talk. Um, but let's assume we've pre-taught those words. What, what do we do next? Well, next we need to build the context. So here we have the perfect way to build context, which is through this fabulous, big, uh, beautiful, big photograph that we have here. Um, now, I'd like to quickly share an experience to highlight what I mean by using the visuals. Um, I was doing some literacy work with uh, five and six-year-olds in, in Hong Kong. And I was doing one-on-one -on -one reading with them. And I was trying to isolate the, the reading strategies that they were using. And I made, you know, I noticed an interesting thing. Um, the beginner readers went straight to the visuals. They looked at the artwork. And they studied this artwork for quite a long time, almost to the point where I started to feel uncomfortable and I would give them the first word of the, of, the, of the reading text. But actually, I was wrong. They were just taking in the visuals before they attempted the print. Now, the emerging readers, they went straight to the print, but then they looked to the illustrations to reinforce, to check what they were reading was accurate. Now, the fluent readers did something very different. They launched straight into the reading, so reading the print. They didn't even look at the artwork. And they read as quickly as they could without really considering the meaning. And I know this because I asked them um, comprehension style questions. They couldn't answer them. So they'd mastered the mechanics of the reading, but they had no clue about meaning. So what does this tell us? As educators well it tells us to exploit the visuals so use those photos use those um, Ill beautiful illustrations in your textbooks so let's have a look at what we have here in this particular lesson now I was at a, new, uh, a National Geographic learning event in Taipei recently and my co-presenter Arlene Kien demonstrated this very well and she used um, a hierarchy of questions to, for, for the different um, uh, mix of abilities in the class. So she started with a closed question, something like this. And I've got some ideas here on the, on the, uh, just pull up my arrow. I've got some ideas here of closed questions and open questions that you could use with this um, illustrate uh, photograph. So we've got, look at the picture. Are these toy robots? Well, everybody in the class can probably answer yes, or they can nod their heads. Well, that's communicating, isn't it? Then we move to some open questions. Um, how many robots can you see? Have a go yourselves. How many robots can you see? I think I counted about 12. <clears throat> and maybe um, what colors are the robots? There are lots of questions you could ask. And then you can move to more inference or critical thinking uh, questions like, do you think these robots are new? Or ask them to react. You know, which robot do you like? Ask them to react to the, pho the photograph. So we've built the contest. They know they're going to be reading about toy robots, a collection of toy robots. So at this point, we can move to 
um, listening and reading to the, reading the the text. So let's just read that text now. I'll just quickly read it out to you. Check. Okay, Claudia Chan Shaw is a toy collector in Australia. She has a lot of cool toys. Claudia has old and new toys. She really likes toy robots. Look at these robots from her collection. Claudia has a robot named Robbie. Robbie is black. His head is big. His arms and feet are red. He can walk. Claudia has another robot named Zuma. He's more than 60 years old. He has short arms and legs. Zuma's body is blue. He can walk too. You can't borrow or play with Claudia's toys. They're too old. But you can watch videos of them on your computer. So that's the whole reading passage. Now, you might think, wow, that's a lot of text for a seven-year-old learner of English. But let's just take a look at that. You'll notice that the sentences are short. The passage is very carefully graded to use known language structures and practicing those known language structures. And in this case, the reading has been broken up into four short paragraphs. So let's take them a paragraph at the time. We're going to just look at the first paragraph. Here we go. Bring it up a bit bigger. So I think we have five sentences there. So here are some of the things that we can do with that first paragraph. And I've kind of ordered them sort of loosely and simple to, to more challenging, I think. So we can have students follow along with their fingers as they listen to the text. We can also stop at random places and have students point to where, where we are, where you are in the paragraph, so you can see if they're actually following along and they're able to read with, along with you. And then we can also do some fun activities like have them have students respond using TPR to certain words. Now, in the previous session, one or two people said, what's TPR? Well, it stands for total physical response. So students show with their bodies that they understand the meaning. So uh, let's see, with this paragraph, we could have on one of the readings, because you would read this several times with your students, we might have where it says, she really likes, hold on, I'm just getting my, my pointer. She really likes toy robots. The students could go thumbs up for like. That would be a TPR gesture. OK, next. Now, I saw uh, the same uh, co-presenter, Arlene Kien, demonstrated this in her presentation in Taipei. And um, I'm sure many of you use this, this technique, is you can cut the paragraph up into sentence strips. And you give out these sentence strips to maybe one set for each pair of students in your class. And then read the first sentence and just have students you know, identify the sentence, find that sentence, and then move on to the next one. Slightly more challenging, with those sentence strips, you can read the whole paragraph and have the students put the sentences in order. That's always interesting. You can also have the class uh, chorus along, read along after each sentence. Or you can ask individual students to read out a sentence each in a kind of reader's theatre style activity. So here's just seven ideas, but I'm sure you have lots more. So you would continue this way with each paragraph. Which brings us to reading comprehension. Now, you would, most people would do some reading comprehension after each paragraph, just to check that the students are following. Um, and also at the end, we've got this um, Activity three here is a reading comprehension question. And in this, in this case, we're asking students to read these sentences and circle the correct word here. So 
So Claudia likes toy robots, cameras. Let me select the, the correct word. Now, I personally prefer students to do this individually because I think if you put them into pairs uh, straight away, there's always a stronger person in the pair and that person usually does all the answers straight away and the weaker um, student doesn't get a look in. So do it individually and then in pairs have them check their answers. That usually works well. Now, let's kind of uh, shift our focus slightly now to how reading can support the other uh, language skills in the classroom. So it's a great springboard for a writing task, drawing, maybe an art project, speaking tasks, and 21st century skills such as presenting, lots of things we can do and we can use reading to support those other language skills. Let me show you what I mean. Um, but before that, let's, let's just start with writing. And I have a sentence here. What do you think? Um, please answer agree or disagree to this statement. Writing is the most neglected language skill in the EFL classroom. So language skill reading, so uh, speaking, listening, reading, writing. I'm suggesting writing is the most neglected language skill in the EFL classroom. What do you think? Oh, lots of agreement with me. Yeah. Okay, some people are thinking perhaps reading is difficult. Yeah. Well, it, it can depend on your class. It depends on lo so many factors. But I think it looks very strongly. If I just close the poll now, we've got like about 93% of you are saying, yeah, they agree. It is neglected. Well, why is it neglected? Because it can be hard to do, right? It's quite difficult for teachers to tackle writing with, with young learners. And so, you know, it, it can, for that reason, be neglected. So what can we do? Well, we can use reading to prepare students for writing. And I really like this quote from Shinan Crandall, which I'm going to read out to you. Reading can be thought of as preparation for writing and writing as producing something to be read. So what we're seeing here is that they can be seen as two sides of the same coin, reading and writing. But of course, we don't want to just throw our students in at the deep end of the swimming pool and, you know, hope that they can swim. And this is a good example of this from another quote here from Scott and Etreberg. The main difficulty with free writing activities seems to be going from nothing to something. And I think what we mean by that is when we hand our students a blank piece of paper and we say, OK, let's write. Can you please write about robots? That's kind of going from nothing to something. And a more effective approach is to give them plenty of scaffolded support. And here's an example of what I mean. We can use um, a guided writing task. So let's use our theme of robots again. And I'm using the same page, uh, the reading page, but from the workbook here. So this is a great way for the students to consolidate their learning. They're doing, they, we're practicing the, the vocabulary and they're looking at the text again and they're doing some, some uh, language uh, practice with the text. And then activity four, which I'll pull up larger here for you so you can see in more detail, is a guided writing task. So first of all, it says, draw a robot. And write about it. Now, you can see here that it's guided because we've provided the sentence stems. So here we have my robot is called, and the students have to think of a name for their robot. The second line, it's, we have, it has sent as a sentence stem. 
Now, weaker students may just write, it has a blue head, or it has arms. You could simply write one word. Stronger students may write a whole paragraph about their, their robot. And likewise with this, the third um, sentence here, it can, you know, weaker students may write, it can walk. And other students may write, it can walk and it can sing a song and it can jump. Now, through this guided approach, do you think seven-year-old learners could succeed at this writing task? Let's have a look what you're saying. Yep, lots of you agree they could succeed. Now, yeah, great. I think there's a lot of agreement in the room. That's brilliant. And some of you have done this. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, let's move on now. Let's 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 run with this. What's the obvious um, follow-on task from this guided writing task? Well, going back to our our idea of two sides of the same coin. You know, writing as producing something to be read. We can let the students share, or to use the fancy term as I have here on the slide publish their work. What does that mean? Well, it just means give others the opportunity to read what they've written. Um, so for this task, what I would do is I would have my students uh, do a final draft on a nice big piece of A4 paper. I would have them draw their robot and then write about their robot underneath. And there are lots of activities we can do with that then. We can do um, a show and tell activity where students read out their work and they show their pictures of their robots. Uh, we can do a poster session. Uh, you can put all the, the papers up around the room and then have students rotate and read, go around the room and read each other's work. They can even comment they can add comments onto the, the paper if you want. So lots of, lots of potential for fun activities there. Or you could put all the pages together into a folder to make a sort of book. Or you could create, like I've got an Im image here of a zigzag book. And you could just leave that somewhere in the classroom for students to read whenever they want. They love doing that. So lots of things they can do to publish their work. So we talked about other productive um, skills. So we can also do speaking tasks with students. Um, for this lesson, one thing we can do is going back to that fabulous photograph of the robots is put students in pairs and play a game. Have one student describe a robot and the other student maybe has, I don't know, two or three guesses to find which robot they're describing. I think students would have lots of fun doing that. Um, we can also go back to this idea of collections, and I've pulled up actually the final page from this, this particular unit. We have a video of students talking about their own collections here, and then afterwards there's a nice uh, pair work speaking task where the students have the opportunity to ask and answer each other about their own collections, because we know well, if I think about my own children, they have Pokemon collections and teddy bear collections and all sorts of things. Um, so students love collecting things. All right. Now, we've talked about learning to read in English. And we've talked about reading to learn English. So let's move on now to reading to learn about the world. National Geographic Learning's mission is to bring the world into the classroom. And this for a long time has been a real interest of mine too. Um, now we can do this with you know, engaging real life readings that link to um, the core content areas like 
subject areas in the curriculum like science, history, geography, art, music, and so on. Now, why would we do this? Well, because it's interesting. And we know that students learn better when content is interesting. So we want them actually to be learning something about the world that they didn't know about before. The big challenge is how can we do this in a way that EFL learners of English can handle? Because what often happens is once we introduce these, this core content, the language level skyrockets up and the students can't understand, which completely defeats the purpose, right? So we need to carefully, very carefully control the language and the tasks so that students can handle the activity, they can understand the context and they take real pleasure in learning about it. Now, if I may, I would like to show you an, an example of what I mean by this. So here we have a lesson called the title of this lesson is, Let's Go on an Insect Safari. And this is actually an extensive reading lesson in the Look series. We have four of these in every, um, in every, in every level. And this is from my level. So that's level two. And this is just uh, providing additional opportunities for students to read through these extensive reading uh, lessons. Now, take a look at this lesson. I've told you the title. Which content area do you think this links to? Which school subject area does this link to? OK, we've got some people saying biology, nature, science, environment. Yep, you are absolutely right. Absolutely right. So in this case, I wrote about an insect safari that some students uh, were doing at my children's school. Now, I want to show you how it's very carefully scaffolded to support EFL learners. So let's quickly or briefly go through um, the, the activities on the page. I think I can pull them up largely. So the first activity, in the first activity, we set the context and we focus on vocabulary, just like we did in the reading lesson. This is important. I'm going to use that fabulous, uh, those fabulous photographs of the insects here and the spider. Then we're going to look at this, uh, we're going to go through this, this reading text. Now, it's a little long for me to read through uh, in this session. Um, but uh, I can tell you that it was very, very carefully graded. And it actually reviews the previous four units from the book. So we're using all the languages that students have learned, the language structures, and we're putting them into this context of insect safari. Um, OK, so you're going to do that in the same way that we did with the reading uh, passage earlier. Next, we want to understand, we want to check that students understood the language, but not just the language, because this is content. We want to understand, check that they understand the topic. So some of those questions are checking their understanding of the topic. And, you know, we know this is, um, we know this is kind of content because we are teaching Ideally, and hopefully, we're teaching students something they didn't know before. Like, you know, in the last paragraph of this reading passage, um, I write about the golden orb weaver, which is this huge <laughs> spider that's found in Hong Kong. It's the size of my hand. There's one at, currently in my garden at home. And these spiders are so large, they can eat a small bird. <laughs> I'm sure your students, you know, wouldn't know that fact. 
And this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about interesting content. Um, okay, so next we're going to have, in activity four, we have the students do uh, a critical thinking task. Now, I loved writing these activities for the book. And in this case, what we do is we have students think about insects and arachnids and think, where can they find these insects? Sometimes they can be found inside, sometimes outside, sometimes inside and outside. They have to use their critical thinking uh, to, to come up with the answer. And we also give them an, an opportunity to add their own insect and to maybe challenge their classmates to decide if they're found inside or outside. And remember, this is all language that students already have um, been introduced to. They know the words inside and outside. And then finally, if we're lucky, we can have the opportunity to apply some of this uh, topic to the real world. So we can ask our students to do their own insect safari. Now, don't be daunted by this because this can be as complex or as simple as you want it to be. It could be simply go home and look on your balcony, see if you can find an insect. If you find one, take a picture, take a photograph, uh, draw it, and bring that back to class the next time. Or you could, you know, perhaps you have a garden at the school, you could take the kids out to the garden or a local park next door to the school and actually do your own insect safari. It can really be quite simple or really quite elaborate, depending on what you want to do and what you can do. Um, here's an example. I'll just pull up this example. This is a child doing their own, doing an insect safari of their own. And here he's using a stick and he's looking through the leaf litter. And he's found an insect, but you can't really see. It's too small in this, in this photograph to see it. But he's actually found an insect in the leaf litter. He's having great fun uh, chasing it around, <laughs> trying to find it. So that's what I mean by an insect safari. OK, so that's hopefully given you a little taster of what I mean by um, linking to, to, to the core, uh, to core content in an accessible way. So, it's kind of time for me to, to wrap up now. So I just want to kind of summarize what I've been uh, talking about today. So, as children are developing their literacy skills, you know, we can't say for sure which combination of strategies are being employed at any given time. This is kind of part of the mystery or, or the magic of learning. But what we do know is that um, as educators, you know, we must use all of those, uh, those strategies, those tools in the toolkit uh, that are available to us. So we might be using systematic phonics, we're using prediction, memorization, we're using the visuals, to, visual cues for context. Um, we have audio support and we're using graded reading texts and so on. Now, at the same time, we also uh, need to, prevent, to, to provide a print-rich environment. So lots of opportunities for our students to read as much as possible. Um, that's the ideal situation. Um, and also, if we can, give them opportunities to read interesting content about the world so that while our young learners are learning to read, they're also reading to learn. And that brings me to the end of my talk today. Thank you so much for, for participating and for joining from all over the world. It's been a real pleasure um, exploring this topic of reading with all of you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so oh, much, thank you. Rachel. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. Um, really hope you found this webinar useful and have some new tips that you can teach uh, to bring to your classroom. 
So great. Um, as Rachel mentioned, many of the examples used today were from Look, which is the National Geographic Learning's new seven-level series for young learners of English. I did put the link in the chat box if you'd like to learn more about that. I know there were a couple questions about ISBNs and finding out more. Um, you can definitely do that through the link I just put there. And we'll also be emailing you some information as well. Great. And exactly, Martha, the world is an amazing place. Open your eyes and look. Um, so great. So again, thank you all. Thank you, Rachel. We will be sending along the certificate of attendance in about five business days following this webinar. So just stay tuned for that. It will be emailed to you. We'll also be sending along the slides from the session as well as the recording. And we do put the slides and the recording up on our website too in our full archive. So you can definitely check those out if you have some time. And we'd love for you to attend another webinar. We do have several ones for teaching young learners, teaching teens, and teaching adults. Um, we have another one for teaching young learners about um, ex assessment next week. So you can sign up on our website. And then we do have a blog for teachers of English. And Rachel would actually be contributing a blog post after this session. Um, be sure to connect with us on our social community. We'd love for you to be a part of it. And again, thanks for joining us. I'm going to send you all to a survey now. We'd love to hear your feedback from this session. And we hope to see you again soon. So have a great rest of your evening, uh, morning, afternoon, wherever it is. All right, thank you.